I want to uh, introduce our next speaker, who is a, a leader, a hacker, an entrepreneur, um, a, a change agent who's creating a, a, a wholly new form of enterprise uh, that is social in every sense of the, the word, that is enlivened by a higher purpose that embodies the principles of social at its deepest, deepest level. Um, her organization is called Inspiral, and I guess you have to think of them as sort of like a 21st century collective, and she's going to explain them better than I ever, ever could, but they are a network of professionals who are driven by a desire, on the one hand, to change the world, and on the other hand, they are a vibrant laboratory for essentially creating a new organizational operating system. They are hacking every single core management process one by one from how do you make tough decisions in, in complex uh, context, how do you uh, do budgeting, how do you set direction and they, in a, an incredibly disruptive way. They're turning them into apps, they're sharing them with the world with huge impact. And Alana Krauss herself is what I would define, you know, sort of the platonic ideal of the next generation leader. I've gotten to know her mostly over Skype because she's in New Zealand. Um, but she's here in a very generous way to share what she's learned in the field when it comes to inventing a new cultural technology. And also, really important meta lessons when it comes to how do you develop, launch, and cultivate successful uh, management experiments. So Alana Krauss, come on up. Thanks, Polly. Uh, it's a real pleasure to be here with all of you. I feel like I'm in a community of some really forward-thinking, innovative people. Um, and I've heard uh, a lot of ideas that resonate a lot about with what I'm going to talk about today. Whoa, thanks. Um, which is fantastically validating, because this is all, all new content, hence the sneaky note cards. I've never given this particular talk before. So, um, First of all, I wanted to just share uh, a little bit about me. I have a really varied background. I was born in California, as you can tell, not a New Zealand accent. Um, I lived a lot of places, Japan, the UK, India, um, before settling in New Zealand. Um, and I've, I've worked in the private sector, I've worked in the public sector, I've started my own companies, I've worked with NGOs. Um, but really, this thread that's winded all through it is about this search for meaningful work and how to have a positive social impact, large impact. And I mean, I thought my CV would never make coherent sense. Um, but when I discovered this community of social entrepreneurs in New Zealand, it kind of all came together. So, um, yeah, I've always been really interested in empowering people and coordinating of groups to achieve more together, and it took me an embarrassingly long time to figure out this had a name, management. <laughs> Uh, and I think that's because I, I never really identified with what this term has been sort of co-opted to mean, which is about positional hierarchy and being somebody's mm. boss. To me, it was always much more interesting, how can you uh, motivate and coordinate people when you can't tell them what to do? That was an interesting challenge for me. So there's some realities in the world right now. This is a quote from a friend of mine about how the cost, the transaction cost, sort of cozy and economic reality, is going through the floor. Uh, it's becoming a lot cheaper to communicate and coordinate people, and, and this is uh, creating some real change. It's becoming a lot cheaper to do things which used to be a lot more expensive. And new social movements, so things like uh, the Arab Spring or Occupy or Podemos movement now in Spain, are realizing the same things that innovative business thinkers such as yourself are realizing, which is that this provides amazing new potential for devolving power, for coordination, uh, for getting groups of people to move together and still valuing the voice of the individual. It, it's not actually that different. And so, Organizations that aren't recognizing this are paying a tax. They're paying the management tax. They're paying a disengagement tax. Now, I don't have an MBA, but I think if you're paying taxes in your business that your competitors aren't paying, you're going to fall behind. So this reality is coming. We've heard a lot about this idea of bottom-up versus top-down organizing and how we can't afford trade-offs anymore, that we have to find a way to synthesize these things into the best of both and to have it all. Um, and I think that's really true. Uh, but it's also important to keep in mind that just removing hierarchy creates a vacuum, that it's not the whole answer. There's a fantastic essay called The Tyranny of Structurelessness by Joe Freeman, which I can definitely recommend, uh, which is about you know, the, the shadow side to the unconscious things that happen if, if we're not creating, consciously creating, proactively creating good structures. So what we want is tyranny-less structures, right? We want to think really carefully and critically about 
uh, the, the tools and processes and cultures we're creating so that we can have great distributed leadership. So this idea of the operating system for a new kind of organization, I think is fascinating. Uh, this is a quote from an anthropologist, which I just heard the other day, that culture is the software with which we negotiate the social world. And it really got me thinking um, that you know, technology is a tool, technology are like the apps, but culture is the operating system that determines whether that app is gonna crash <laughs> or whether it's gonna run. Um, and I'm, you know, many of you may have had the experience of introducing new technical tools and having them just fall flat on their face because they really need to be backed up by the right cultural operating system. So this brings me to this idea about digital technology and cultural technology and how uh, they affect each other. A digital tool is never the whole answer. And this might sound funny coming from somebody who makes digital tools, <laughs> but it's really not. They're not gonna work for you the way that you want unless they're backed up by, yeah, organizational culture. And really interestingly, the culture then feeds back into the digital tools. So it really affects how the tool evolves. I mean, technology is this wonderful, ever-changing, ever-adapting, evolving thing, right? That's why we love it, it's iterative. Uh, but it's like in evolution, the environment that it's evolving in is gonna have a huge impact on, on where it goes and how we use it. So that's where culture comes in. Which brings me to Inspiral. So this is the uh, community that I'm a part of. It's a network of social entrepreneurs and social enterprises based in New Zealand, uh, really brought together on this theme about more people working on stuff that matters. Yeah, I think it has a pretty unique structure and a unique culture that's allowed us to, to make some new kinds of innovations, which I'm gonna tell you about today. Um, and I think Inspiral is, it's like a hack of business itself. It's like, let's take these really powerful tools that we call business and use them to try to make the world a better place. It doesn't mean that we don't care about making money, but it's about revenue streams in service of positive social impact, and that's sort of the heart of social enterprise. So, um, this is some of us, some of Inspiral. So, um, yeah, we are a group of now 180 people, which is, yeah, um, somewhat big and somewhat tiny, depending on your frame of reference. We have a lot of interesting, what I call cultural technology. So I wanna dig into a little bit about what I mean by that term. Culture can be a, a little bit nebulous, um, depends how you, how you use the term, but um, I think it's really made up of quite practical, nitty gritty processes of how we are together as humans, how we work together, uh, what are the practices that we do every day, all the time, that define, um, yeah, how we are together as people. This is a picture of us at our last retreat, and spiral retreats happen every six months. Uh, we go away together. They're not required. They're optional, but most people love them. Um, there's no specific agenda. It's not about getting certain work done, but there's also no organized fun. It's not about that either. It's just space. Uh, somebody said earlier that innovation comes from giving people just space and time, and so this is really what that's about. Um, people use this time to do work together, to talk about ideas, or to have those deeper conversations about how their work connects to their deeper passions or political ideologies or whatever they want, and they use this time to go out for walks in the woods and play sports together. Um, it's really like, it's not about work, but it's the most important work that we do. Another example of cultural technology that I see a lot around in the Inspiral community is check-ins. And so when we're coming together to have a meeting which is about work, and we all already know each other, and we know what we're there to do, uh, we still go around the room and every person will check in and say, how they are, not where they're at with the work, but how they are as a, as a person, you know, because if they're, if they're sick or their kid is sick or they're tired or they're really excited and they've just had a big win, like these things are really relevant to how to work well together. And you'll see people dynamically kind of adjusting their communication or their collaboration style to uh, suit where people are at. So that's an important aspect of, of cultural technology. So Inspiral is a network. Um, it's structured as individual social entrepreneurs who also organize themselves into social enterprise companies. And we all are together in this network and just focus on mutually supporting each other. We're all there because of values. We're all there because we want to have a positive impact. So success for you, for your ultimate goal of social positive impact is the same as for me. So we really help each other quite a lot. And I'll tell you a little bit more uh, details about how we're structured. We have all kinds of spaces for collaboration. Like I said, we have retreats. Um, we also have a, a co-working space in Wellington where about 40 or 50 of the 180 Inspiral people are based, and a lot of people are based in a lot of other countries and places around New Zealand as well. Um, and of course, a lot of online spaces for collaboration. Uh, we use all kinds of tools and we make tools ourselves, and that's an important aspect. 
So this is sort of the evolution of Inspiral, and don't worry if you can't see the tiny text. Uh, just the idea that it started with this vision of more people working on stuff that matters, uh, that really attracted a diverse range of professionals. We have you know, computer programmers, designers, lawyers, accountants, consultants, really all kinds of people who've just graduated college, all types. Um, and these people have organized themselves often into companies. Um, and the companies are sort of, you can imagine, uh, around this thing in the middle called the Inspiral Foundation, which is a charitable company which is there to facilitate collaboration between the people and companies. And now we're coming to this really exciting next phase, which is about taking the internal processes and tools and stories from Inspiral and open sourcing them. Uh, a lot of times that takes the form of actual open source software. Sometimes it is just about sharing, sharing what's happened, sharing where we're at. So those are those arrows going out everywhere. I'm really excited about this new phase that we seem to be moving into. So here's one example. This is Lumio. This is how we make decisions together at Inspiral. Um, we call it collaborative decision making. It really came out of a need that we had internally. Uh, we had a distributed network of 150 people and 180 people trying to make decisions together. Uh, that's really hard. So yeah, we've had to develop this tool. We use it for everything from um, deciding what kind of coffee to have in the break room to board level decisions, hiring. I think the very first, actually the very first discussion we ever had on Lumio was about the language in our employment contracts and every employee was involved in that discussion of what are they gonna be asked to sign uh, and a lot of decisions since then. So I submitted the story of Lumio to the mix um, and I wanna tell you a little bit about the trigger that brought this about. Uh, late 2011, around the time that Occupy was going on around the world, it was also happening in, in Wellington, New Zealand, and there were activists occupying Civic Square in Wellington. And they were having uh, quite a transformative experience with consensus decision making. You may have uh, heard about what they were doing in Occupy, people coming together in circles and general assemblies and, and trying to make consensus decisions using hand signals. Um, and this was the first experience a lot of them had had with consensus decision making, which of course stretches far, much further back in history than that time. Uh, but some people from Occupy came to see us because they heard we were good with technology and they said, uh, we're having some issues because uh, sometimes people can't make the meetings or sometimes some really loud voices dominate and it turns into a conflict or, uh, you know, we try to, how do we get work done between meetings? We try to all email each other and that's a big mess. But you as business people probably don't have any of these problems. <laughs> I said, actually, now that you mention it, <laughs> Yeah, actually realizing that a group of business people and a group of activists were facing exactly the same challenge, which is about how do you have a group of people and do meaningful, inclusive, transparent decision making that also has to be fast and effective and high quality decision results. That's what we care about, right? Um, so they said, can you build us a tool? And we said, we can't build it for you, we can build it with you, and we gave them a desk in our office. And so. The team came together. It's a, it's a diverse team. Um, I was one of the original founders, uh, along with yeah, activists, but also facilitators, business people, technology people. Lumio is a user-friendly online tool for making decisions together. Here's how it works. I've got a decision I want to make with a group of people. Using Lumio makes the process easy. I give the discussion a name and invite the people who need to be involved. Discussions on Lumio can be public or private. Because it's online, all kinds of people can participate, from anywhere, at any time. We can bring together the relevant information and build shared understanding. Anyone can propose a solution. Within the proposal timeframe, everyone has a chance to state their position and briefly explain why they feel the way they do. This highlights the main points, creating a summary so others joining in can quickly catch up. This participant has raised a great point that's got everyone thinking. As new information comes to light, you can change your mind. Sometimes an early proposal failing can be a productive step that leads to a new proposal addressing everyone's concerns. Great ideas can come from anywhere. No one knows what all the possibilities might be. Because you're all thinking together, when you arrive at a decision, everyone is on board. The whole group is notified of the outcome, so you can start taking action together. If you make lots of decisions with the same people, Lumio can become your group's online home. It creates an archive as you go, so it's easy to see all your decisions. Thousands of people are already loving Lumio. They're being more inclusive and spending less time and energy to get better outcomes. Imagine using Lumio in your workplace and in your community. 
Lumio is, and will always be, free software and open source. It's mobile, so it will work on your phone and across all kinds of devices. It's accessible to people of all abilities. It's safe, meaning you can take control of your own data. And best of all, Lumio 1.0 is really easy to use. It's a whole new Lumio for truly inclusive decision making. So after making this video, my living room was covered in tiny bits of paper. <laughs> but it was really fun. Um, yeah, so the process, Lumio process is what I like to say deceptively simple. Uh, groups come together, people can raise discussions with a topic and give some background information and people can make comments that'll be really familiar to you if you've used pretty much any online tool. You can at mention people, put in links and images and documents and that sort of thing. Um, but really importantly, it doesn't presuppose the options. It's an open generative phase of the conversation. The idea being that you, you don't know where all the ideas might be. You don't know where the great perspectives are. You want to leave that space. Um, so there's no time limit for the initial part, um, but then the next step, hopefully, just like at a really good uh, in-person meeting, and the, out of the conversation arise potential ideas or solutions, and people can raise proposals. And proposals have time limits, and they're quite clear. You have to know if I'm agreeing to this, what am I agreeing to? People are invited to state their position. Um, and you know they can interact. It's not, it's not a poll. It's not just yes or no, majority rules. It's not majority rules. It's more multidimensional. You've got yes, uh, which means I agree, and no, which I call a constructive no, which means I think we can do better. Um, abstain, which is, I think, a really important signal. It's really different than just not participating. It's mm -hmm. I've seen this, but I trust the group, or I don't have enough information, or I don't really care. I'm choosing my level of engagement. Uh, and then this option of block, which is really rarely used, but quite powerful just to know it's there, that any one voice can have uh, the power to stand up and say, hey, I really don't think this is right. This contravenes everything that we're about, or this is going to really go against our ethics, or some really strong red flag. Um, and this idea of not being at majority rules, I think, is quite important. It doesn't flatten out the, major the minority. You know, if you're making a decision that 40% of your group disagrees with, I, I think you can do better. I think that by listening to each other's perspectives uh, and gaining shared understanding can work towards solutions that work for everyone and address everyone's concerns. So when you give your position, you're invited to write a short kind of Twitter-length statement that it says why you feel the way you do. And you end up with a list of uh, how everybody feels and why, and that's a really powerful thing because it's simple and it shows what's the crux of the issue. If we disagree, let's figure out why and start working on it. Um, oftentimes, if a, like, if a first proposal does fail, the next one will be a new evolution, a new idea that nobody came in the room with because you've been listening to each other. If people have concerns, what you see in Lumio groups is people tend to swarm on, let's try to solve it, let's try to think of something better. And when you do reach shared understanding, uh, everyone can be notified of the outcome. There's an outcome statement that you can put in there. and. What you find, it's powerful because everybody's already on board. Everybody knows why this decision was made. They feel listened to. They feel like they own the outcome. And you may need to invest a little bit more time in the beginning, but then once you get there, the group is often ready to take action together. So unlike a sort of a social network where it's really open-ended conversation, Lumio is hyper-focused on let's come to a point and go do something together. So, this is a point that I'll, I'll come back to, the idea that the culture created the tool. Like, Lumia grew out of a real need that we had in our culture because it was participatory. We couldn't do things without asking everyone, so we had to figure out a way to do it. And then the tool then re-impacts the culture again. It provides us a space to do future innovation and to work in the way that we believe in. It attracts people who want to work in that way and makes it easier for them to do their daily work. So, virtuous cycle. So Lumio's uh, taken off. As soon as we released even an early alpha version, we were kind of overwhelmed with interest. It turns out a lot of people are facing this problem. Uh, we've had, yeah, thousands of people around the world getting involved. Uh, just wanted to give you some examples of exciting people around the world using Lumio. Uh, the Podemos movement in Spain, which I mentioned, which is now on top of the Spanish political polls, has picked up Lumio in a big way. Thousands of Spanish Podemos Lumio groups now. Um, they organize in circles, which is something that we've heard about today. Um, and we've seen just a huge uptake there, which is great. Um, Wikimedia, Wikipedia, the Wikimedia Foundation, which is behind Wikipedia, uses Lumio to organize internally. A group of Harvard law students, this was just in the Crimson, Harvard Crimson today, is using Lumio to uh, deliberate the policies around Title IX and sexual violence at, on campus, which I think is really inspiring. 
uh, a national post office in Europe, a travel startup with team members in five countries has found Lumio really transformative for their business. Um, a New Zealand government department, which is rolling it out internally to their 800 staff, specifically to build internal capacity for collaboration ahead of an external consultation with the public out of a recognition that if you can't do this well inside, you're not going to have a great time doing consultation externally. And that's uh, true for anyone who's going to consult with their customers, I think. Lumia has been released in 29 languages, all done by volunteers. We have a really vibrant user community with many, many more in progress. Some great stories out of uh, translation. Um, Lumia was picked up by the Taiwanese uh, student democratic protesters recently, um, and they translated it into Taiwan Chinese. And then the next thing we knew, we were seeing a bunch of sign-ups from the Taiwanese government, who were then using it on their side to organize, <laughs> which is really great. <laughs> Um, Lumia was uh, translated into Hungarian by, again, a group of student activists who were protesting education cuts in their country. So they organized, and then the faculty, academic faculty jumped on, uh, and they were organizing in solidarity with the, with the students. And then a group of high school students all over the country started organizing in solidarity with those two. And then we saw uh, the mountain climbing club and the small businesses, and this is kind of how it spreads in communities. Uh, like I said, we have a really vibrant user community. Uh, Lumio is a community-driven project. Right from the start, we have hundreds of users who actively tell us what features do they want. We collaborate on decision-making about Lumio on Lumio. Um, we just hosted actually a really interesting discussion about the financial model of the business itself. We just put it out there to the whole community, five, six hundred people in there now, and we had some extremely thoughtful responses. Um, amazing discussion about what is, what is fund, a funding model for a mission-driven company look like. Um, and there was a proposal raised, and the users all agreed, yes, please charge us. For, my, for the tool, so uh, I feel uh, really good. I'm gonna feel really good when we get the payment model up there because the users are telling us this is, this is what they want. They want this thing to be sustainable. Uh, so this brings me to my next example of innovation coming out of Inspiral. Um, another uh, uh, thing that I submitted to the mix about collaborative funding. Um, so this again came out of an internal need at Inspiral because uh, we have to figure out a way to do the budget. The trigger for this was actually kind of interesting. Um, as we scaled, uh, we ran into the same challenges that any organization runs into as you begin to scale. And we began to kind of throw more people at the problems of ma management or admin, even though we weren't really calling it management, uh, operational stuff. And we ended up slowly, kind of before we knew it, we had this team of five people who were kind of trying to run, <laughs> run the whole company. We, I was part of this team. We were really stressed out. We were drastically under-resourced, trying to kind of solve all the problems of the network. And we were just, I remember we were sitting around the table uh, looking at each other going, this is, not, this is not right for us. This centralization, this bureaucratic solution to this, uh, this is not the way we do things at Inspiral. So we fired ourselves. <laughs> it was a really kind of a scary and exciting moment. We didn't know what the right answer was. We just knew that was the wrong answer. And we said, okay, we're not going to do this role anymore. Network, figure it out. And, uh, and we, so we had to start thinking about all of the core business processes that we were doing uh, deconstructing them and rebuilding them in distributed ways that worked. So a solution that we came up with it had to be it had to be easy. You know, people were not going to engage with budgeting and funding if it was like profit and loss reports. You know, no one's going to be reading those. Or most people aren't going to be reading those. Um, it had to be engaging and it had to be effective. We needed to make good decisions about our budget. So we started uh, coming up with solutions. So the way that uh, the money flows at Inspiral. Um, Basically, all of the, the people and ventures make contributions to the Inspiral Foundation. These are voluntary contributions. Some of them come in the form of time or skill sharing. A lot of them are, are in the form of financial contributions. Um, and these come in uh, specifically to support the network as a whole. And then we all decide together, using a tool that we've developed called CoBudget, how to spend the money, uh, how to allocate the funds. So anyone can propose a project, and then everybody gets together in a process, which I'll, I'll explain, and, and decides. Uh, they, can, they have dollars that they can allocate, uh, directly, and they say, I want my money, my part of the budget to go here, I want my part of the budget to go there, and then we decide which, which projects we're going to fund. Um, so this is a really early alpha version of the co-budget tool. Uh, it's, it's now in testing. Uh, we started with a really ugly MVP. We started doing collaborative funding using spreadsheets and just asked people to experiment, and we optimized this process, and then when we felt good about it, that's when we started actually building the software. Um, it's actually and fun, it's fun to do budgeting, I know this is unbelievable, but it's colorful and it's gamified and people look forward to it, we do it once a month and people actually, I really look forward to it, um, because you feel like an investor, you feel like I'm investing in the projects that I care about at my company. 
So here's the results of the first year of collaborative funding. We're now almost at the end of the second year, but these are the real numbers. You can see on the income side all the money coming in from the different uh, and spiral companies, and then the expenditure side, uh, those were all the projects that we funded. Um, and some important aspects for us in terms of, of what it's done for us. Um, the first thing is, is really just cost and time savings. I mean, that group of five people has been downsized to one part-time person, runs all the admin for the entire network, um, and they do it because they have these participatory processes and all of the work is actually done by the whole network together. Um, and they're just there to sort of to run the back, uh, the back end of that. Um, this has been transformative for us in terms of meaningful transparency. So transparency not just being about making the information available, but actually making the information accessible so it's meaningful to you, so you can interact with it, so that uh, you can make decisions based on it because you know what it's all about. Um, it's allowed us to do really engaging reporting, <laughs> and uh, that's something which, you know, maybe it sounds boring, but to me that's actually really inspiring because, you know, I can send out a report like this and everybody looks at it and goes, I know exactly what that means. I invested in that project. This is really meaningful to me. Um, and also this idea of really uh, financial literacy. Like, we have everything in the budget. We put our operations costs in there. We put our fixed costs in there. Everybody then looks at that and goes, oh, that's how much an accountant costs, or that's why we can't fund the company party or whatever, because we have to, you know, of course we have to fund this thing. And so everybody kind of owns those trade-offs or, uh, yeah, financial literacy, really important for collective leadership. Uh, the other thing is uh, a shared ownership of outcomes. So some of these pie slices, we funded some projects that failed. Now that just happens sometimes. Um, and what happens is at the end when it fails and it falls apart, there's no finger pointing because everybody took that risk together. That's something that we all had a, a voice in, that we all decided to do, and sometimes project fails and that's okay. And when things succeed, we're able to all celebrate that together because we all actually feel like we're a part of it. I think for me, one of the... Um, most important impacts of doing collaborative funding has been the connection back to strategy setting. Like the idea that bund budgeting and funding shouldn't just be about uh, advocating for the things you want money for, that yes, I want to do this. It's about if we say yes to this, we have to say no to that. And that's where the strategic thinking part comes in, right? If you're looking at the whole budget and you're making these calls, um, the first question you have is, okay, but what are we trying to achieve together? Like how, what should be my framework for making this decision? And so um, we also have a collaborative strategy setting process at Inspire, which I'm not gonna have time to go into, but we put the strategy points you know, on the top of the budgeting every, every month and people make decisions uh, related to you know, what we're trying to achieve together. So again, the idea that the culture, out of our culture arose this need, out of our, uh, our culture arose this uh, solution, and then the tool itself facilitates the culture that we want to have. And interestingly, uh, building the co-budget software itself, that project was funded through collaborative funding. So you can see how this starts to create a virtuous cycle of innovation which can then become self-perpetuating. So this brings me to the technolo cultural technology challenges, and this is where I wanted to kind of relate this back to, I think, challenges that people in any kind of business would face. And I know that our, our environment might be very different from your environment, um, but, and the solutions that you would come up with or would work in your environment might be completely different from ours, but here's some things that you might want to think about. How might they play out in your environment? Um, one of them is, give good ideas a place to go. So for me, when I worked in a private sector hierarchical corporation, this was my biggest frustration as somebody who's always having good ideas and trying to optimize all the things. My manager didn't want to hear it and it was very frustrating and I, I just felt like it was a, a bad use of all of the resources of all of my coworkers as well who know the work really well. Um, and I think if you're a leader in an organization, it's your, it's your job to create these channels so that good ideas have a place to land, however that might be right in your own environment. The next one is recognize and value facilitation. And so facilitation is a big word. It's a big word for me. Um, and I think it's something that's drastically undervalued in many organizations. And, and for me, it's the, um, yeah, it's just, a, it's not about the person who's at the front of the room talking and what they're saying. It's about reconceiving leadership as the ability to create space for others to be empowered and to take action. And holding that space is not a trivial job. 
um, being able to dynamically sense the needs of the group, being able to uh, understand what barriers to participation people might be facing and help remove those barriers, and also things which I think are very much under-recognized, like bringing the snacks, is the room ventilated? Is this meeting at the right time of day? Did we send out a reminder? Stuff that's called admin is oftentimes, for me, the most important leadership work that goes on at a company. So um, taking these things seriously. Um, and the last one is kind of related, asking this question, who's not in the room? What voices are missing from this conversation, and why might that be? And this is kind of getting at the heart of um, yeah, the real value of diversity, um, all kinds of diversity. Of course, the things that we usually talk about with age or background or gender, but also things like just people's, uh, people's situations. You know, do they live further away from the office? Uh, you know, is there, do they have small children? Are they an introvert or an extrovert? And recognizing that diversity plays out in all these ways, but that's where the power and the richness of uh, of the group really lies, and if you can bring out all of those voices and weave them into the collective process, um, it's going to be it's going to be amazing. You know, this idea of of groupthink. You know, it's really easy to egg, egg each other on, all going in the wrong direction. But valuing minority voices or uh, understanding which voices aren't being represented is really the antidote to that. You know, we might think that our organization is quite radical, um, but I actually don't think it is. I think all of the digital technology and cultural technology that I've touched on is, is about this stuff, and this is stuff that I, th I think all, all business people care about, all leaders care about. The idea that uh, the individual and the collective should not be a trade-off, that we really need to get the best from individuals and the best from the group. Um, we need both. Um, just thinking about two, two contrasting stories, one of which is the famous story about the wisdom of crowds where you have a, a jar full of gumballs and if you ask one person how many gumballs are in the jar, it's very unlikely they're gonna give you an accurate answer. If you ask a lot of people and, and aggregate their responses, you will get close to an accurate answer. But contrasting that to Horton hears a who, you know, that idea that sometimes that singular voice that, that sounds crazy or maybe um, is distracting or inconvenient, it can be the key, can be that piece of information that you absolutely need right now to stop you going in the wrong direction or add a lot of value to your group. So let's have both. Let's have both the wisdom of the crowd and the valuing of individual minority voices. And so lastly, this just brings me back to this idea of digital technology and cultural technology in this virtuous cycle affecting each other, innovating, uh, innovation coming out of the culture, into the technology, back into the culture. We create the tools that make the organization we want to work in possible. Um, and that comes from, yeah, that comes from who we are as people and how we work together. And so I think that we, we all need to consciously create the digital technology and the cultural technology, uh, the tools and the practices and the processes for the workplaces that we want to work in, and also for the, the world we want to live in and the society that we want to live in. So, thank you very much. What were your more personal, like, inside questions like you were asking yourself through all this process in terms of fears, or mm. possibilities, or decisions? because you were like impacting others. Do you have something you want to share about that? Yeah, absolutely. I think that, um, I mean, for me, my journey being part of Inspiral and being in this community has been deeply, personally transformative and a really, a, a sort of a healing experience of, of coming into an environment which is a safe space for vulnerability, a safe space for real honesty, um, and that being able to be on that level with people who I also deeply respect and I'm also trying to achieve a lot together with has been an uh, incredible combination and I've been pushed, you know. Uh, when I first came in, I was more the kind of person who was a bit hesitant to stand up and share something personal in front of a crowd, but here I am sharing something personal with you right now. This has been a, a real journey for me, but I feel like if we want to be great business leaders and if we want to achieve great things in the world, we have to work on ourselves sometimes from the ground up, and we have to do that in community with the people we respect and we want to achieve things together with. And in order to do that, you have to just be, uh, you have to put yourself in some scary situations in the sense of, in the sense of vulnerability, in the sense of honesty. The, the ideas that you're forwarding about kind of saving time in the long run, yep. making this investment in, in really empowering people at different levels to make decisions, feels like there might be a little bit of 
a trade-off in the short term. If you're really giving so many tools and taking up time up front, asking everyone to weigh in on this, how do you kind of make that argument across organizations? Sure. I think I will, I will steal um, actually from Gary Hamill. He came to Auckland and gave a presentation and uh, said something which I think is a great answer to that question. He told the story of somebody running a change management process without consultation. Uh, they invested a whole lot into it and they rolled it out and then it was a big failure as that statistic on, uh, was up there before. So many change management processes are. And what he said was um, speed to implementation is not the same as speed to success. <laughs> um, and that's absolutely true. I think that... Um, I think it's, it's the wrong calculus if you look at it and say, oh, it's, it's too, it takes too much time to, to ask people what they think. I mean, we take a lot, I mean, in Spiral's culture also has a lot of DNA from software development, especially agile software development, and it's that classic story is if you're alone in a room, to get, alone in a room by yourself making software, it's very hard to make something which is actually going to be useful and serve the user needs, and so there's all these... Uh, better ways of doing things which involve actually going out and testing things and making an MVP and testing on people and iterating based on their real feedback. And, and that's the same kind of process. It really is just being open to uh, doing something experimental, a little bit rough. It's, it's like how fast, how fast and cheaply can you fail is the question you should be asking. How can we get out there and start testing these assumptions and see if they're right and then start following what the people we're trying to serve, whether that's your employees or your users, your customers, uh, if you're trying to serve them, then you need to follow what they're telling you, and if you don't give them a chance to talk to you, it's very likely you're going to go way off in the wrong direction. Yeah. Thank you, Alana. Thank you. Thank you.